I must say, happy Mother's Day to our moms, especially the ones that are here today. It is a celebration of moms, both here and gone. And it is happening around the world. And I say that because I know there's some countries that probably have a different day designated for Mother's Day. But I also know that there's those that come from the United States that have this day as their Mother's Day around the world that are on the phone sometime today, more than likely, if their moms are still around, calling and saying, Happy Mother's Day. So Happy Mother's Day this morning. Um, before I get into it, because you know what, m m being a mom, is, it, it is, I, I, you know what, and I have to say this from a guy's perspective, the hardest job in the world. <laughs> I don't care, there's no education that you can really acquire except for that that is hands-on, because you know what, you can learn, I, 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 don't, know, I don't know about you guys, but uh, you know, I went to Lamaze with Connie, and you know, they show you, this is what's going to happen, and this is how you change a baby's diaper. And I'm going to tell you what, I don't care how many dolls you put in front of you, you never learn what it means to do stuff like that until it is happening. And, and none of them, none of them have like the, the, the worst case scenario of raising kids. And then I have to say this, because I'm going to joke with, with Boomer back there for just a moment. Boomer, you know what, we, we lost um, a, a, a dog a few months ago. Lady, Lady was a little Yorkshire Terrier that, that we have had for many, many, many years. In fact, Boomer was five years old when we got Lady, and Lady was his dog pretty much from day one. And he took care of that dog. And, and as, here's the thing about being parents, may I say this? As you age and, and, and growing up as parents, you've started to, for, to forget some of the things as it was raising your kids. And, and then Boomer, he, he got a new puppy, oh, two weeks ago, I think it's been now, that was eight weeks old. And Boomer has been shocked into the reality of what it means to take care of a little one. And you know, you can say puppy, little kid, whatever. They all do the same thing. They eat, they use the restroom, and they are up at all hours <laughs> until you train them. It is time for to go to bed, okay? And so we all have to go through things that are so closely related to what it means in raising kids. But my hat's off to moms, those who take care of kids, because it is the hardest job in the world. And then if anyone wants to argue with you, you know what, you guys go ahead and battle it out with them. I will step aside. <laughs> I would like to be in two areas of scripture. One in the Old Testament, so if you like, you can turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter two, and then we are also going to be in Matthew chapter 12. Those two areas of scripture, Exodus chapter two and Matthew chapter 12. One of the reasons that I would like to be in Exodus chapter 2 is because we are going to talk about one of the greatest moms in history. I joked with some ladies downstairs um, about speaking on this, and, and it was fun because no matter how you go through the scriptures, you will find many godly women and all on, the, on a level that, that you should um, take as as we take a scripture to learn from, you will find where moms in the scriptures have been great examples. And I will go as far as saying they are super moms. Um, I say that because downstairs the kids are learning about super moms. They are also in Exodus chapter 2 learning about a super mom. In Exodus chapter 2, you have, before the very first verse is mentioned, you have where there is just gobs and gobs and gobs of Hebrew children that are slaves in Egypt. And as they are slaves in Egypt, one day Pharaoh looks out and he really realizes, you know what's happening? 
they are about to outnumber us. And I don't care how strong your army is, eventually, if you outnumber an army well enough, you can take over that army. And so Pharaoh had a fear within his heart that these Hebrew children, they are going to outnumber us and they are going to take over my kingdom. And so he came up with the greatest plan in his mind. And it is a plan that, is, is, that really brings us into reality of what it means to uh, make babies and have babies. And it can only be done in two kind, it, 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 with two things, a man and a woman. You cannot go around, I don't care what kind of science you have, you will never get around the fact that you need a guy and you need a girl and their things to make a baby. And so he decided within his heart, if I remove one of those things, then there will be no more babies coming around. And so he decided within his heart, as, a, as, as the Pharaoh, I will start to kill every baby boy. And so when I eliminate them baby boys, they are not going to come up and be this army against us. They are not going to make other children They are going to come up. And so he had this plan devised to kill babies. Pharaoh right away has decided human life has no value. And not, at least not for his kingdom. And so here we are in, in Exodus chapter 2. And you have a woman who marries a Levi and they have a baby and when they have a baby <laughs> I'm at verse 2 she gives birth to a son and in my text it reads this way she saw that he was special let me pause here for a moment help me out because um, it's not just about moms all right and this this message is not just about moms you're gonna find out very quickly but it's about everybody uh, when you have a baby I don't care or when you have a, a close relationship to a baby it comes this way just like Moses's mom man that baby's special I just looked at it day one that baby special I don't care what kind of things they got now that they're not contagious no more my baby's special and so we start to look at the baby as that baby is special and it was the same with this with Moses's mom she looked at him and saw he was special and she kept him hidden for three months now, I don't know about you guys but as I read this story that's phenomenal have you ever tried to keep something quiet for three months uh, I, I joked about boomer and his little puppy I'm telling you here's right, here, here, here's okay don't don't beat him or nothing but he's a bad parent He's got his big old earphones on. He's playing his game. And I still think he can hear it. This puppy's whining at the door at 11, 11 p.m., 1 a.m. And I'm like, ah, let's take that dog out. And, and, and so what takes place is to hide a baby, a baby that cries all times of the day, a baby that is hungry and all of a sudden this crying comes up, a baby that wants to be nurtured and hugged is crying, a baby cries all the time and Moses' mom hid Moses for three months. Can you imagine, because remember what I said about, about Pharaoh, Pharaoh wanted them boys dead and so you know they had people going around, any kids, any kids, can you imagine when the, the knock comes around, any kids, any kids, any boys? And can you imagine how every time that would happen, every time she was going to the market, every time something, for three months, Moses' mom had to have this little bit of a fear of, I hope they never discover my special son. So she hid him for three months. And then it says this in Exodus 2, but then she came to the realization that at that time she could no longer hide Moses. Actually, may I help you out here? In the scriptures, it's she could no longer hide the baby. It is always the baby, the baby. She could no longer hide the baby. And so what she does, please, this is where I start to grasp this super mom mentality. As she is walking as a Hebrew child, as one who is of God, in God's eyes, these are God's children. That woman 
has placed within her heart. What do I do about this special child that I do not want to die? And so she decides to, to build this little boat and she puts these reeds together and she brings some tar and some, some pitch and she makes it all nice and waterproof and she lays a three month old kid into that thing and she brings it to the river Nile by the, wheat, the reeds and she lays it in that water by the reeds and let it go. Verse 4 says, the baby's sister is off to the side at a distance watching to see what is going to happen to my special baby brother, to mom's special baby son. And so as she's standing there, the sister sees the Pharaoh's daughter come down to the river to bathe. And she has with her her squadron of maids that kind of come along with her. And I, by maid, I mean not someone that does all the cleaning, but these ladies that go along right down there with her, they also come down to the river and as those attendants and she are walking around along the riverbank she sees the basket among the wheat the reeds and says to one of the ladies i need you to go down there bring that basket to me and when she opens that basket the little boy is crying and it says in scripture, she felt sorry for the Hebrew mom's special baby. She felt sorry. She looked at that baby and her heart was moved. And I, I have to say it in this way. I want us to grasp that God is always in complete control of everything. And he is involved in everything. And especially when he calls his Hebrew, Hebrew children his, he is watching out for that special child in this moment. And as she lifts that lid up and sees this baby crying, as her heart is moved, it says this. She looks at the people that are with her and she says these words right here. Let me get down to it. This must be one of the Hebrew children. I'm going to stop right there for a moment. This must be one of the Hebrew children. Now, can I say this? That means the Pharaoh's daughter knows about, you know what, if I'm about to pick up a Hebrew child that's a baby boy, that boy has got to die because Pharaoh, my dad, says that baby has got to die. And now she has just exclaimed to everyone around her. See, the other thing is, if you're taking notes, is note that as God has his Holy Spirit on your life, it affects not only just you, but it affects those that are around you. So as she, with her own word, says, this is a Hebrew child, it not only affected the woman who still felt sorry for the child, but it also affected the attendants that were right there with her. Because everyone in this situation has to make a choice. Does that baby live or does that baby die? Pause, and I'm not going to get all on it. I'm just going to say this. That thought process has not changed today. People have to decide whether that baby lives or that baby dies. Remember, on the baby, that's special. <laughs> Mama already said it was special. <laughs> God has already said every baby is special. I'm just going to be right there, and then I'm going to keep on going. And so as she has, in her own speech, said this is a Hebrew child, it has affected those attendants, they have to decide, do we tattle on the daughter? Or do we keep silent? What do we do? Daughter, what are you going to do? Is this child going to live? Or is this child going to die? At that time, oh, let me say this before I go into what happens. Society will tell you one thing, that it has nothing to do with the way God has designed for society. 
not just in the Hebrew times, but in all times. Society will tell you things that is not of God, but know this, that God has the power to go beyond what society says. God has the power to go beyond what society says. So that's why we're in this dilemma. What do we do? And so immediately, remember, sister, big sister, watching over special baby brother, sees what happens, runs over to the daughter. You got to grasp this. You have a Hebrew person coming up to the Pharaoh's daughter, not an attendant. The sister comes up and says, should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse that baby for you? At that moment, the daughter, the Pharaoh's daughter, had to decide, what do I do? Because now, <laughs> this story is dicey. What do I mean by that? Because not only is it a Hebrew child that she has announced to everyone, but now I'm about to, I'm offered to bring in a Hebrew woman to take care of a Hebrew child that's supposed to die. And so the sister said, do you want me to go get a Hebrew woman to nurse this baby for you? And what did she do? In an instant, she came into, remember I told you, God has the power that's way better than society. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Go get a Hebrew woman to come and nurse this baby for me. And so what does she do? <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> Does she go and get any Hebrew woman to nurse his baby? No. She goes and gets special super mom that was so worried about special baby to nurse baby that is hers because she's a Hebrew child and that's a Hebrew child and God looks after all of his children and so that mom now is holding on to the special baby. And as the mom comes to the Pharaoh's daughter, the Pharaoh's daughter looks into the mom's eyes. See, remember when I said she announced it's a Hebrew child. And she looks into the Hebrew mom's eyes. And she says, take this baby and nurse him for me. Remember what I told you right from the very beginning? This mom thing is probably the hardest job in the entire world. This is what every mom would love to hear from a king, a queen, a princess, our government. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> this is what every mom wants to hear. Not only do I want you to take care of your kid, but I will pay you to do it. You got all wondered, really? That's what it says in scripture. She looked at the Hebrew mom, Hebrew mom and said, take this child nurse him for me, take care of him, and I will pay you for what you are doing for me. So now we have Moses. Verse 10 says this, later when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. We are at this one point where everything is totally the opposite of what the society was saying. Not only did she raise that boy up to a certain age, mom did, but she gave her over to the Pharaoh's daughter who adopted Moses as her son in the Pharaoh's kingdom, in the Pharaoh's palace is a Hebrew child that should have been dead and he is about to move up the ladder to number two. God is way better than society. And so, now, now can I say this too? Can you imagine? Because they're in that they're slaves in Egypt, so they can't leave. So mom 
gets to see son do what he's doing in the king's palace, the pharaoh's palace, as he grows up to be a young man. And then, do you, do you wonder if God is in all of this? Yes, he is. Because in verse 11, it says many years later, when Moses had grown up, he did what? Did he do all the things that was of the Pharaoh? Did he do all the things that was of the palace? Did he do all the things that was just of Egyptians? No. It says in verse 11 that he went to visit his own people. And he saw how hard they were forced to work. Now you can go ahead and read all, all of Some of you are like, oh yeah, Charleston Heston, he showed us what it really is. <laughs> we know all the rest of the story. That's fine. Go read the rest of the story. Find out that how a mom, a super mom, followed God as his child. And look what happened. And then you will see what's going to happen because of what mom did. And a million people come out of slavery. Whew. More story. But we have where God worked through a super mom and it changed society. You hear what I'm saying? Moses grows up, and Moses leads a million people out of slavery. Mom, who followed God, who was with God, who, who, who all of that raised enough to have a man come back to his people and lead them out of slavery. Changed society. So as I, for, 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 for moms, thank you. Yeah. Moms who follow God, thank you. Ladies who follow God, thank you. Because you are the ones that are examples for changing a society from what they do to what God does. Well, we're going to get to that point because some don't. Um, We've got to be honest. So now I'm going to go over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 in these last few minutes. Matthew chapter 12 is full of the Savior. Full of the Savior and what He does. From the beginning of the chapter down to the end of the chapter. But you got to know that at the beginning of the chapter, Savior, 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 what He does is an example of what's going to take place at the last verse in chapter 12. And then that goes on to all eternity for everyone, even you and me here today. Are you ready? Matthew chapter 12. He begins to teach us an understanding of the Sabbath. What it means to honor the Sabbath. He then also teaches us that, you know what? You know what took place? And, and here's where there's issues of society versus God. Because you know what he did? Society says don't walk a certain number of steps. Society says don't go to the grocery store. Society says don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do none of this is what society was saying. And the Savior comes in and he heals on the Sabbath. And did they ever have a problem with that? Because think of it this way very quickly. Remember I talked about how that special baby was? Jesus looks at a human being and realizes you are value. And so he heals a man on the Sabbath because he values life. And immediately... Those religious leaders, those religious teachers, the ones who knew from way back here with Moses was what? Thou shalt not kill. And what do they do as religious leaders? We will kill. We, we hate Jesus. We've got to kill Jesus. And from this point when he healed that man on the Sabbath, we got to start plotting to kill him because we do not value life like God does. We value life the way society does, not the way God does. And so we will kill Jesus. So then Jesus leaves that area. If you were all in chapter 12, I'm just paraphrasing. You've got to read it yourself. But he leaves that spot. He leaves that area. And when he leaves that area, guess what happens? When someone who is the Savior, when someone who follows God, and I say that because of Moses' mom following God, and you can look at all the others that follow God, when you see the Savior, and when you realize, if I follow the Savior, things happen. Society does this, but God does this. I'm going to follow the Savior. And you know what they did? They left with Him. And they followed the Messiah. 
they followed the Savior to this other area. And it says in chapter 12 that anyone that was sick, in fact, everyone that was sick got healed. See, society ain't like that. The Savior is. Everyone got healed. So if you walk up and you got an ailment, you got healed. That's what took place in this setting in chapter 12. And did they have a problem with that? Oh, yes, they did. Because Jesus, after healing all those people, in chapter 12, it says, he healed a man who was demon-possessed. And all of a sudden, religious teachers, religious leaders have a problem with that. What are you doing healing a demon-possessed man? In fact, you know what? They get in their little, little, little church corner. He must be demon-possessed himself. In fact, he must be in cahoots with Satan himself. The only way that he could do that is to have Satan on his side. And him and Satan cast out demons. And then scripture in chapter 12 says, see, he wasn't even over here with them in their stupid little conversations. He says in, in, the, in the scriptures, it said, but he knew their thoughts. He knew what they were talking about. And so he begins to teach religious leaders. Any kingdom divided by a civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is casting out Satan, he is divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. Man, them are strong words from the Savior. Just so we put in perspective, you the society says this, but God says none of this is of him. None of this will take place. This over here is going to crumble and fall, but not this. And so if you're going to say that Satan is the one that does this, his own kingdom will not survive. And, and it goes on down. I'm at verse 30 in chapter 12. He says, anyone who, who is, excuse me, anyone who, who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, it is fruit will be good. A good person produces good things from the treasury of what? A good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. I'm telling you, Things have not changed. If you will slow down and look around at real people, you will see who real people are. Their either heart is either good or their heart is evil. And if their heart is good, good godly things will come of it. If their heart is evil, just call it society. I mean, you got to label it something. See, people want to go, oh, no, 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 it's that person. No, it is all of society. You know why? Because society brings evil hearts up. Uh, go home and munch on this a little bit. Society brings evil hearts up. Godly situations bring godly people up. There's no way to have the two together. They will be together, but there's going to be those that are evil of society and those that are godly, and you will know the difference. And be held accountable for every word you speak. So now we are down to the end of that chapter. At the end of the chapter is an emphasis on what will be of anyone who follows Jesus' teaching, who follows God, who gives way to the life of the Holy Spirit, lived out in them. Now, if you don't fall into any of those categories, and I'm going to tell you this, those categories all go together. You cannot leave one out. You follow Jesus' teaching, who follows and leads you, shows you God, and he gives you the Holy Spirit so that you can do those teachings, so that you can know God, and so that you can be the one that has good fruit, the one who does good godly things, versus society that does evil. That can only be done with those three things. And with those three things, we come to, if you have your Bibles at chapter 12, go down to verse 49. As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mothers and his brothers 
stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, ready? This is, this is kind of weird. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then in verse 49, then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and my brothers. Now that's weird. Ready? Let me put you in Brent's thought process. Ready? He looks at a bunch of guys <laughs> that are his disciples in the conversation that he's having with them. And as this person is saying, hey, your mom and your brothers, let me help you out here. Mother Mary and your brothers, <laughs> your real brothers, are right out here and they want to talk to you who are my mom and who, who, who's my mom and who's my brothers hey you see these guys that I'm talking to these men now I can handle this part they're my brothers they're my mother what, what? <laughs> it's uh, now let me help you here society here's how society twists scripture and they would be rejoicing woohoo guys can be girls girls can be guys wrong because he had no intention of meaning that just so we get on track where Jesus says you see these because verse 50 explains the whole thing verse 50 and if you underline your Bibles or highlight your Bibles it's the very first in my text three words anyone who does anyone who does Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Pastor Mark, come on up. We're about to close. So it comes down to this. Who is the true family? See, we're about to, you know, I'm going to call my, my mom and Connie's mom. They're all in, in Illinois, northern Illinois. I'm going to call mine up. Connie's already talked to her mom. And, and everyone's got their cards, you know, and then their little gift in the card. And I'm going to call my mom. Thanks, mom. I'm so happy that you saw me, number one. And when I say number one, because I am number one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the oldest. I'm the special one, okay? And, and so I'm going to thank my mom, okay, who valued me. But when we talk about the truth, and I love my family. My family's huge. I love my family from my family to my extended family. And I'm going to go even deeper to my church family because of this. Who's the real family? Who's the real mother? So let me put it this way. Who here today is the super mom? Who here is the super dad? Even I can almost preach the same sermon next month. Because <laughs> next month is super dad day. Okay? You know what I'm really glad about? Uh, the society got one thing right. And that was honor your mom and dad. And those are on Sundays. <laughs> they don't float on any other day. It's on Sundays. Then there's a, I think it was two months ago, ready? Two months ago was sibling day. And that might even been a couple of weeks ago was sibling day. So who is the super brother? Who is the super sister here today? See, because it is not just about moms. It's about what Jesus did. All that teaching and all those extra moms throughout scripture showing us this. It is the ones who follow God. And how are we going to do that? How are you going to be this super mom, this super dad, this super brother, this super sister? Right here. Pick it up and start reading it. Because remember what the scripture said? Those who do. How do you know what to do if you don't pick this up 
and do this because society will tell you almost almost always the complete opposite or they will water it down and make it so messed up that you have no idea if it's truth or not so pick this up read it put it in your heart be that good heart that produces good fruit and do it be the one who changes a life that is around you remember back in Exodus this must be a Hebrew child and everyone was affected by those words what do we do are you one who follows God with the work of his Holy Spirit in your life what will you do because that determines who we are in this family how we affect things and I, I ask you this be the change be the godly change in the world around you it's a challenge see it's not just about moms moms are great especially the super moms the ones who follow the Savior and lead by example and raise up a generation to come that follows the Savior and you know what as Jesus said my mother my brothers and my sisters are those that do the father's will raise up that next generation some of you are like I'm too old to raise up another generation just like in our Old Testament reading <laughs> I'm too old <laughs> to have a kid <laughs> we know how those stories go in scripture but you don't have to have a kid to raise up the next generation we can be a, we can be a prayer team that is on fire for prayer that is praying for individuals like the grandkids that are down there and their friends that are down there and the kids that come in and out be one that is on fire for prayer for that next generation and I'm gonna say this and here's the thing do not forget the generation that we are in because we are all children of the King so pray for that generation to follow and do his will let us stand as we get ready to sing this song we're about to sing a song that talks about the home. And I'm telling you this, when you go all through Scripture, you're going to find out those homes that follow the Savior are the homes that raise the next generation. Those homes that follow the Savior are the happy homes. Those homes that follow the Savior and His Holy Spirit are the ones that begin to do things for God. Happy is the home that follows the Lord. Let us pray. God, if there is someone here that does not know you in that way, may they come to grips with the family where you are the head of the family. God, we come into your, into your place asking for forgiveness if there's things that we have done that are so much evil or so much sin or so much, um, you can list any label on it, but it is not of you or about you. God, please forgive us. Help us to be that brother, that sister, that mother, that dad that is on fire for you in doing your will. Help us to seek and know your will. Help us to have, have ears and hearts to hear and, and know exactly where we are placed in that family line doing your will, God, so that those that are around us are affected by our words that are your words. In Jesus' holy name.